Welcome to the first of what will hopefully be many drawing tutorial videos from my new YouTube series, Draw With Me. Since we're rapidly approaching the Christmas holidays, I thought it only fitting that in this first video, I walk you through how to draw this cute little snowman who is blissfully enjoying his favorite time of the year. So if you're someone who's been wanting to learn how to draw cartoons digitally, or someone who's been drawing cartoons for quite a while now, but just never considered using a vector software like Adobe Illustrator to do it, then stick around, because this video is for you. Hey guys, Craig here. Hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so before I get started, I just want to do a quick rundown of all the equipment that I'm going to be using throughout this video. So to start off, I'm obviously drawing in the vector software Adobe Illustrator. I'll also be using my custom doodle art brush pack, which is available in my Gumroad store for $5. And just know that I've recently created a video that showcases all of the brushes in my pack, as well as how and when to use them. And I'll put a link to that video at the end of this one. And finally, I'm drawing with a Wacom Intuos Pro medium-sized tablet. So if you're new to digital drawing, I have links to all of this stuff in the description section of this video. And for full disclosure, know that I am affiliated with both Adobe and Wacom. So if you should decide to use one of my links to purchase one of these products, I'll receive at no extra cost to you a small commission for referring you. And it's those commissions that allow me to continue making the type of free content that you're about to watch. So thank you. That being said, let's start drawing. All right, so to start off, I'm gonna create a document that's eight by 10 using the color mode CMYK that has raster effects set to 300 pixels per inch and that is set up in portrait mode. As for why I'm using CMYK, I create every illustration with the intent to use it commercially. And since most commercial printers use CMYK for printing, it only makes sense to create every project in CMYK. Now as far as my workspace goes, I'm starting off with four tabs open. I have my Doodle Brush tab, my Swatches tab, which I've already pre-selected for this piece, and I'll get into why I chose these particular swatches a little later on in the video. To the far right, I have my Color tab, as well as my Layers tab. Now in my Layers menu, I have two layers created, my Ink layer and a second layer titled Guides. You don't need this guides layer. I'm actually recording two separate versions of this document at the same time. The long version, which you're seeing right now, and a short time-lapse version, which is on my other monitor. These blue guidelines are for that screen, and they're just so that I don't draw outside of the dimensions of the video. But I'm gonna keep these guidelines turned off on this document because I don't need them here. So all you need to get started is a layer titled Ink. Okay, now when you first open up Illustrator using a CMYK document, there are a few things that you're going to need to change before you start. First, you need to change the stroke color to a pure black. To do that, just double click on the stroke color swatch and then move the picker all the way to the bottom left hand corner. In the top menu, you can turn off the fill color and that's simply because all of these doodle brushes are strokes, not fills. I also like to change up a few tools on my toolbar before I get started as well. The top two tools should be switched over to the selection tool, which is the black arrow, and the direct selection tool, which is the white arrow. Now a little further down, I'm also going to switch out the shape builder tool for the bucket fill tool. Other than that, everything else can pretty much stay the same. Now to make this a little easier for you guys, in the bottom right hand corner I have two charts. The one on top is the brush stroke weight. The reason that I'm putting that there is because I'm going to be using three different stroke weights throughout this drawing and this chart will just make it easier for you to see which one I'm using when I'm using it. I'll have an arrow next to the brush as well as the stroke weight that I'm using at all times. The chart on the bottom contains the steps for the cleanup process that you're going to be using to get rid of the lines that you don't want. Now I'm going to walk you through the process the first few times, but I'm going to leave these steps showing so that as the video goes on, I won't have to go through each step every time, and I can just refer to all of them together as the cleanup process. Okay, so before you start drawing, the first thing that you're going to need to do is determine where your light source is coming from. But you may be thinking, why are we worrying about the light source when we're not even coloring yet? And it's because these brush strokes have a built-in varying line weight. And whenever you can, you always want to try to make sure that the boldest part of your brush stroke is on the same side as your shadows, while the thinner part of the stroke is on the side of your light source. So if your light source is coming from this direction, then you're going to want to have your thinner lines here and your bolder lines over here. So for that reason, you want to determine where your light source is coming from right from the beginning. So for this drawing, my light source is going to be coming from the top right hand corner. 
Now I'm not going to leave this here for the entire drawing because it'll make my time lapse short video look a little funny. But just remember that this is the direction that our light source is coming from. Okay, so I'm going to start off by using my double taper brush and I'm going to set the stroke weight to 0.65. Again, because my light source is coming from the top right hand corner, I'm going to keep my thin lines over to this side and my thick lines over here. Now before I start drawing, I'm going to double click on my paintbrush tool to open up the paintbrush tool options menu. I want to make sure that my fidelity is set all the way to the right on smooth. This will keep my brush strokes from getting jagged if my hand starts to shake. So we're going to start off by creating the body of the snowman and I'll start with his head. Now you don't want to make these body parts perfectly round. They should almost be bordering on oval shapes. If you need to slightly resize the line, you can always do that with your selection tool. Once you finish the head, it's time to draw the body. And don't worry if you don't get these shapes exact. A large portion of these lines will be covered by the other elements of the snowman. And besides, I personally think that imperfection adds character to an illustration. So don't worry about making everything perfectly symmetrical. Just make sure that you're starting your strokes on the top right hand side so that the thinnest part of the brush stroke is facing your light source. And if you don't get the shape that you want the first time, hit Ctrl Z on your keyboard and try again until you get it looking the way you want. Okay, so now that we have the body drawn, it's time to do the cleanup process. So grab your selection tool, that's the black arrow, and holding down your left mouse button, drag your cursor across both of these strokes to select them. Next, go up to the object tab in the top menu, and from the drop down menu, choose group. Then with your object still selected, go back up to the object tab, and from the drop down menu, choose expand appearance. Keeping your object selected, go up to the object tab once again, only this time go down to live paint and then from the sub menu choose make. And the last step of the cleanup process is going back up to the object tab, down to live paint one more time, only this time choose expand from the sub menu. Now using your direct selection tool, that's the white arrow, you can select each of the overlapping strokes that you want to remove from your illustration and delete them. So as you can see, the chart in the bottom right hand corner is just an abbreviated version of the cleanup process that I just walked you through. So whenever I refer to the cleanup process throughout this video, just repeat the steps that you see in this chart. When you draw on Adobe Illustrator, you're going to be doing this cleanup process quite often. But don't worry, once you've done it a few times, it all becomes second nature to you. Okay, so now it's time to draw the snowman's face. This is a great time to determine where your line of center is going to be. I'm just going to switch over to my rough brush and bring the stroke down to 0.25. The first thing that I want to figure out is how high my eyes are going to sit on the head. Now from this point I have some options. I can put my line of center down the middle of my drawing which will give me a front view of my character. So I'd have my two eyes, my nose and my mouth as well as my buttons on the body all right down the middle. But personally I'm not a big fan of always drawing from the front view. And that's simply because I think you can add a lot of nuance to your character by drawing it from a 45 degree angle. Doing that eliminates the symmetrical aspect of the drawing, which is usually present when drawing from the front perspective. And that slight facial feature unevenness is going to add a lot of personality to your character. And for that reason, I like to put my line of center just off to the left or the right of my center line. For this drawing, we're just going to keep it to the left. Okay, so for now, I'm going to lock out the body layer and then I'm just going to select all of the center lines together at once and then go up to the object tab in the top menu and choose group. And then I'm going to go back to my layer menu and unlock my body layer and lock out the center lines layer. Now I'm only going to keep these lines here until my face and body ornaments are drawn. After that, I'll just delete them. Okay, now I'll just do a quick save and then we'll move on. Alright, so on the face, we're going to start off with the eyes. I'm going to switch my brush back to the double taper brush and bring my stroke weight to 0.5. Your boldest line should be reserved for the body. Everything that you add to the body from here on out should have a lighter stroke weight. Now don't worry about keeping the thin lines facing the light source while you're drawing the eyes. We're going to be bucket filling them in with the color black anyway, so it won't matter. Once you have your first eye drawn, grab your selection tool and holding down your alt key, drag a copy of it over to the left. Now you need to keep in mind that this head is round, not flat. So as we go further to the left, we're actually going around a curve. And because that curve is going off into the distance, and because these eyes are flush mounted, meaning that we only see the surface of them, 
our left eye is going to be slightly smaller as well as slightly narrower as it goes off into the distance. Just imagine looking at the face of a coin while it's standing on its edge on a table. If you begin to turn that coin, the overall surface of the coin that's visible to you is going to become less and less as you turn it. And if you were to simultaneously move that coin further away, it would also get smaller and smaller from your perspective. And these eyes work exactly the same way. Also, keep in mind that due to the tilt of the head, the left eye will be slightly higher as well. Now when you're doing a 45 degree perspective, the space between your line of center and each eye doesn't have to be equal. Just like the surface of the eye gets narrower as it goes around the curve, so does the space between your line of center and the eye. So that space between your left eye and the line of center is going to be slightly smaller than the space between your right eye and the line of center. And that's simply because it's going around the curve, so we're seeing less of it. Okay, so while I'm still on this 0.5 stroke, I'm going to move down and draw the rocks that will be representing the snowman's buttons. In this situation, try to keep the thin part of the stroke pointing towards the light source. Okay, so to finish off the face, I'm going to bring my stroke weight down to 0.4. When it comes to creating the nose or any other appendage, there's a rule of thumb that you need to remember, and that is, short is cute. When it comes to illustration, the longer you draw something, the further away it gets from being cute. Just think of the cartoon characters that were drawn throughout history. When Pinocchio has a short nose, he's a good little boy, but when he has a long nose, he's a liar. Batman and Robin, who are good, both have small noses, but the Joker and Penguin both have long noses, and they're evil. The Good Witch in The Wizard of Oz had a short nose, but the Bad Witch had a long one. As someone who has a long nose, I'm not exactly thrilled with this rule, but it is what it is. This rule has been ingrained in our brains, so if you want your character to be good and cute, keep things short. And that starts with the nose, so make this carrot short. Now I'm going to draw this carrot with a little overlap stroke on the bottom to show that there are crevices on the carrot. And you also want the base of the carrot to be round to show the cylindrical nature of it. Now when it comes to the smile, you could draw the smile directly in the middle of the center line and it would look fine. But when you draw a smile off to the side of the center line, it becomes a smirk. And a smirk is always cuter than a smile. Now I usually keep my smile and eyebrows fairly thin, but if you want to thicken them up a bit, that's okay too. When it comes to drawing the eyebrows, where you place them is extremely important. If I was to draw them in the middle pointing downwards, that would make this character really devious. We don't want that. We want our snowman to be filled with childlike exuberance. So for that reason, we're going to draw our eyebrows over the back part of the eyes and angled upward, giving him a look of intrigue. Okay, now that we have all of our facial features drawn, it's time to do the cleanup process. So just to go through it one more time, grab your selection tool, that's the black arrow, and holding down your left mouse, drag your cursor across all of the line art. Next, go up to the Object tab in the top menu, and from the drop-down menu, choose Group. Then, with your object still selected, go back up to the Object tab, and from the drop-down menu, choose Expand Appearance. Keeping your object selected, go back up to the Object tab once again, down to Live Paint, and then from the sub-menu choose Make. And the last step is just to go back up to the Object tab, down to Live Paint one more time, and this time choose Expand from the sub-menu. Now using your Direct Selection tool, that's the white arrow, you can select all of the strokes that you want to remove from your illustration and delete them. Okay, now that I have everything that needs to be centered centered, I'm just going to delete these centerline guides from my layers menu by selecting the layer and then clicking on the little garbage can icon at the bottom of the layer menu. Alright, so the next thing that I'm going to add to this little guy is a set of twig arms. I'm going to use the double taper brush for this and I'm going to set it to a stroke of 0.4. Now again, just like the nose, shorter is cuter. Long arms are creepy on cartoon characters, so you want to keep these short as well. Now if you're finding it hard to get an angle on your stroke, double click on your brush tool and lower the fidelity a bit. That will keep your stroke from being smoothed out too much. Keep these twig arms simple. There's no need to have five fingers on these hands. One or two will do just fine. I think I'm going to switch over to my right taper brush just to get a little bit of a crisper point on this last stroke. Now if your strokes don't line up perfectly, you can always grab your direct selection tool, that's the white arrow, and just double click on your control points or anchor points of your strokes and move them to where you need them to be. And then just use the control arms to smooth out the curves. 
Okay, I'm going to go back to my double taper brush to create the insertion point in the snowman's body. Now some people like to just round off the end of this twig where it meets the snow, kind of like I did with the carrot nose. The difference is that we're actually viewing this twig arm from a side perspective, so you wouldn't see that rounded edge of the twig. You're more likely to see where the snow was displaced when the twig was inserted. So to get that effect, we're just going to use two overlapping strokes. Now that the first arm is done, I'm just going to create another arm on the opposite side of my snowman. If you need to change the fidelity of the brush, feel free to do so. And once again, adjust the stroke control points as needed. Now depending on which perspective you're drawing your character from, you always have to be thinking about the order of anatomy. In other words, what body part is in front and which body part is in behind. So in this case, because our character is facing to the left, the right arm is in front, the body is behind the right arm, and the left arm is behind the body. For that reason, we can see the insertion point of the right arm, but the insertion point of the left arm is being blocked by the body, because in real life, it would be on the other side of the body, which is not visible to us. When it comes to the arms, try to stay true to the angle of the eyes when it comes to creating the second arm. So just like the left eye, the left arm should be a little higher than the right arm. Okay, so now it's time to do the cleanup process and eliminate all of the excess lines. Remember, you're removing the lines that would be behind or hidden by the object in front of them. Okay, so the next part I'm going to draw is the scarf. I'm going to use my double taper brush again and I'm going to create the top of the scarf with a stroke of 0.4. I'm doing this because I want the stroke on the top of the scarf, which is receiving the most light, to be thinner. Now because the snowman is such a small character, to emphasize that point, it's a good idea to make his clothing a little bit too big for him. So I'm really going to use up a lot of this area between the mouth and the buttons on the stomach. Now this is important. Start your brush stroke a little bit outside of the head. Make sure that you have a nice clean point to your stroke, because you're not going to be deleting this overlap. And I'll explain why in just a minute. Don't make your stroke a perfect curve. Add a little bit of wave to it. It's just going to give the scarf a better look. So the reason that the end of the stroke needs to hang out over the edge of the head is because this line will represent the edge of the fold where the scarf goes behind the head. So as I draw the next part of the scarf, you can see that I'm starting above my last stroke and that I'm starting from behind the head, making sure to leave a nice space between this stroke and the end of my last stroke. Now because the stroke is going lower in this scarf, I'm going to raise the stroke weight to 0.5 because there's going to be a lot more shadow on this part of the scarf. You want to make sure that the end of your stroke is running parallel with your top stroke. This will give the illusion that the scarf is all flowing in the same direction. So do you see how by starting a little higher up it makes the scarf look like it's coming from around the back of the head? This effect will become a lot more apparent once I remove the bottom stroke of the head. Now I'll do the same thing on the other side. When you're doing the bottom of your scarf, make sure to keep your stroke wave consistent with the top stroke. And if you find that your strokes aren't lining up properly, just delete them and start over. Again, I'm following the wave of the top stroke when drawing my bottom stroke. I know that this might all look a little confusing because of all the overlapping lines, but trust me, once we do the cleanup process, everything will work out just fine. Now it's really important that the bottom part of the scarf isn't going over the left hand. If the scarf is too close or covering it, it's going to look a little crowded and could possibly even create a tangent, which is just basically two lines from separate objects that line up in a way that make them look like they're part of the same object. Okay, so the next part of the scarf that I'm going to create is the overlap where the scarf actually ties around the neck. So I'm going to start off with the first stroke. Now I want there to be a center crease on this part of the scarf, so I'm going to overlap my last stroke that I created with my new stroke, only I'm going to bring it out wider this time. And again, I'm going to follow the wave of the stroke. Now my last stroke is going to come off of the middle stroke, kind of like the letter M. And once again, I'll be sure to follow the wave from the other two strokes. Now on a side note, when you're placing the overlap of the scarf, don't line it up perfectly centered between the buttons and the right arm. Make it off-center. Those slight imperfections add a lot of character to your drawing. When it comes to drawing the bottom of the scarf, pay attention to where the center crease is, because that's going to be the high point of the fold. So you want to make sure that your bottom stroke is going upwards where it would meet the crease line. Now obviously there are two ends to a scarf, 
So we're going to need to draw the other end. And I'm just going to have that coming from behind the scarf. And once again, I'm just going to follow the wave of that top part of this scarf. Now because there is no visible crease to the bottom scarf, I'm going to make the bottom stroke follow the bottom stroke of the top scarf. It'll just make it look better aesthetically. Okay, now we have to go through the cleanup process. Using your direct selection tool, start removing all of the unwanted strokes. And make sure that you don't remove this overlap here. What you want to do is delete the bottom part of the head instead. So what you're basically doing is removing all traces of the head and body from under the scarf. And while you're at it, delete all of the overlapping strokes from your scarf as well. Continuously removing these lines over and over can take a little getting used to. Sometimes it can be confusing as to which lines to keep and which ones to delete. Just remember that you want to delete the lines that belong to the object in behind from the object in front. As you can see, once you get it all cleaned up, that scarf really starts to pull the drawing together. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to draw is the hat. I'm going to use my double taper brush once again and I'm going to set the stroke weight to 0.5. Now just like I tried to make the scarf look like it was going around the head, I want to do the same thing with the hat. So I'm going to start by creating a stroke that's coming from behind the head. And this would be a good time to set your brush fidelity to smooth. Now I'm just going to create some overlapping strokes that kind of follow the contour of the head. My goal is to get sort of a puffy cloud or a cotton ball look to the trim of the hat. The reason that I'm using a 0.5 line weight on this stroke is because these bottom strokes are going to be on the shadow side. And just like I did on the other side of the hat, I'm going to finish off with a stroke that goes behind the head. Okay, so once I have all of the bottom strokes done, I'm going to reduce my brush stroke weight to 0.4 to create all of the strokes that are on the top of the trim and that are facing my light source. Try not to make all of these brush strokes equal in length. Having them vary a little in size will give the trim of your hat a much better look to it. Now that I have my trim done, I'm just going to switch over to my right taper brush to start off the hat itself. I just want a nice tapered stroke for this first part. Now I'll switch back to my double taper brush to create the flute of the hat. Look at how jagged my stroke guideline is. When I finally remove the stylus from the tablet, you can see just how much the smoothing is actually cleaning up my stroke. This is one of the things that I love about Adobe Illustrator. You can have shaky hands and still create great line art. Okay, so now I'm going to grab my left taper brush to add in a couple of folds. Now to finish off the ball of the hat, I'm going to switch back to my double taper brush and I'm going to create the top part of the ball with my brush stroke weight still at 0.4. Once I finish creating the strokes that will be in the light, I'll increase my stroke weight to 0.5 to create the bottom shaded part of the ball. So the ball pretty much has the same design as the trim of the hat does. And as for where the flute of the hat meets the ball, I'm just going to use that same overlapping effect that I used on the right arm of the snowman. I think I'm going to reduce the stroke weight of the overlap to 0.4. Okay, so now I just have to do the cleanup. And remember to use the chart in the bottom right hand corner if you can't remember all of the steps of the cleanup process. When it comes to removing the overlapping strokes, you want to start by removing the head strokes first. From there, just remove the overlapped strokes in a way that makes the trim look like there are sections in front and sections in behind. And as you can see, by using this same technique that we used on the scarf, the hat looks like it's actually seated on the head instead of just in front of it. Which lines you need to remove will become a lot more obvious the more you do this. Okay, so now I'll just finish cleaning up the ball of the hat and then we'll be all done. Just make sure that you're saving your drawing as you go. Now I don't want to leave my snowman just sitting on blank space. I want to make it look like he's surrounded by chunks of snow. And I want these chunks to be sort of jagged, so I'm going to lower my brush fidelity to about halfway. Now there are two things that I want to point out before I start. As I create these chunks, I'm going to be putting the largest ones directly in the front middle of the snowman and then have them get slightly smaller as they go off into the distance. I'm also going to lay them out in kind of an arrow shape 
so that the bottom of my drawing almost comes to a point. Now when it comes to creating the snow chunks themselves, because the top part of the chunks will be hit by sunlight and the bottom will be in shadow, I'm going to use a lighter stroke on the top and a heavier stroke on the bottom of each chunk. And because you're using two separate strokes, you may have to use your direct selection tool to line up the strokes properly. To save yourself some time, just create all of the bottom strokes first, then you can just go back and create all of the top strokes with the lighter stroke weight. Don't worry about getting these exact shapes, any random shapes will do. Just make sure that your top strokes are overlapping your bottom strokes so that you get a closed off shape when you're cleaning up. Just think of these snow chunks as stones surrounding a flower bed. Not every stone is going to be equal in size or shape. The most important thing is that you're covering up the base of the snowman so that it doesn't look like it's just floating on air. Try to keep your top strokes moving in the same direction as your bottom strokes are. So both your top and bottom strokes are going to be higher up in your composition for the back chunks and lower down in the chunks that are up in front. Doing this will help keep the overall flow of your drawing moving nicely. It's also not a bad idea to add in a few smaller chunks randomly throughout the pile. Again, this is one of those situations where you don't want to space everything evenly. Make sure that the placements are fairly random. And don't go too large with these smaller chunks. The main purpose is just to fill in some gaps between the bigger chunks. And not all of them have to go in front of larger chunks. A few of them can be peeking out from behind the bigger ones. Okay, so once you have all of your snow chunks created, go through the cleanup process so that you can remove all of the overlapping lines. When you're doing the cleanup, always make sure that you're making it clear which objects are in front and which are behind. If you ever find yourself in a situation where one of your strokes hasn't overlapped another stroke, just delete it. Redraw that particular stroke and then go through the cleanup process one more time. And if something ever looks out of place, just delete what you have and fix it. It's far better to take a few minutes to fix your mistakes now than to try and fix them after you've painted the illustration with shadows and highlights. The process to fix the illustration at that time will take a lot longer. Okay, so the last stroke I want to add is the ellipse for the background, and I'm just going to use my ellipse tool for that. I'm going to set my fill to transparent and my stroke to black. Now just for aesthetic reasons, I'm going to keep the ellipse perfectly round, but I'm going to position it more towards the front of the snowman. Doing this will balance out the composition. I think I'm going to set the stroke weight to about 4 points. While I have the ellipse tool out, I think I'm going to add a couple of circles for the specular highlights of my eyes. I'll bring the stroke weight down to around 1. You want to put these little highlights closest to the direction of the light source and make sure that your highlights are in the same spot on both eyes. Because the light is coming from the same direction, the highlights would most likely appear on the same part of each eye. And don't forget to make the highlight in the left eye a little smaller as well as a little narrower. Now before I do the cleanup process, whenever you use the ellipse tool to create a shape, before you combine the ellipses with the rest of your drawing, you always want to expand them first. 
So select all three ellipses, go up to the object tab in the top menu and from the drop down choose group and then do it again and choose expand. Once you've done that, you can now go through the normal cleanup process with all of your line art. All you have to do is remove the bottom part of the background ellipse and then the drawing part of your snowman will be done. But what I would do as just a final touch is select your drawing, go up to the object tab, and then from the drop down, go down to live paint and choose make. This will allow you to bucket fill in the drawing with color. All I want to bucket fill in right now are the two eyes with the color black. Now if you find that your specular highlights are a little small, just select your drawing, go back up to the object tab, down to live paint and choose expand. Then using your direct selection tool, just delete the stroke around your specular highlight. So if you were creating a children's coloring book, just this line art portion of your drawing could be used as a single page. But chances are you may also want to use this drawing on the cover of your book as well. Or you may want to license out your artwork to a third party or print it on a t-shirt to sell. Either way, you're going to have to color it. Now if you should decide that you don't need the background ellipse for your book cover, then just delete it from the drawing. Okay, now it's time to add some color. Now before we begin coloring, we need to duplicate this ink layer a few times. To do that, just drag the ink layer down to the plus icon at the bottom of the layer menu. You're going to want to have a total of four copies of this layer. And you're going to name the other copies flats, shadows, and highlights. And the order in which these layers will be placed in the layer stack is the ink layer on top, the highlights layer under that, the shadows layer will come next, and the flats layer will be on the bottom of the stack, in that order. And the order is extremely important. Okay, so let's talk about swatches. Now as I said earlier in the video, I've already pre-selected the color swatches that I'm going to be using for this illustration. And I'll put a list of the colors that I'm using in the description section of this video. I'm not going to go into any great detail as to why I'm using Pantone swatches, but if you want more information about the difference between RGB, CMYK, and Pantone colors, watch my video 10 Tips for Creating Better Book Covers. You can find it in my self-publishing 101 playlist. But for the sake of this video, all you really need to know is that Pantone colors are the closest thing to both RGB and CMYK at the same time. Pantone is a color picking system that is very close to both color modes. So when you use Pantone color swatches, the colors you see on your monitor will look pretty much the same as when you print them on a physical product. And that's why I use them exclusively when I'm creating products for prints. Now if this swatches tab isn't open in your workspace, just go up to the window tab in the top menu and open it from the drop down menu. To actually open up the Pantone color chart, all you have to do is click on the three line icon in the top right hand corner of the swatches menu, hover your cursor over the open swatch library, and then go up to the color books, and then finally down to Pantone solid coded. The entire Pantone solid coded library will open up in a new tab. Now when you're referencing the list of colors that I give you in the description section of this video, to find any particular color in this chart, all you have to do is type the name of the swatch into the search menu and Illustrator will isolate it for you. Then you can just drag the swatch over to your swatch panel for later use. And if you want to see all of the color options again, just click the little X in the search bar. It's that simple. Okay, so I've already chosen my color, so I'm going to close this panel. So with the flats layer selected, I'm going to grab my selection tool and select the illustration. Then I'm going to go up to the object tab and down to live paint and then I'm going to choose make. This will allow me to start bucket filling in some color. Next I'm going to grab the bucket fill tool and then I'm going to select the red swatch in my swatch menu. Now I can just go and bucket fill in both the cloth portion of the hat as well as the scarf. Ok once that's done I'll select the orange swatch and fill in the carrot nose. Next. I'll select the brown swatch and fill in both arms. After that I'll select the gray swatch and fill in the stones on the belly. Make sure that you fill in the white areas with the color white, don't leave them empty. So that would be the trim in the ball of the hat as well as the specular highlights in the eyes. Now I'm going to be using a gradient for all of the snow areas, but for now I'm just going to fill in all of those areas with a light blue color.
Okay, the dark blue is for shadows and the yellow is for highlights, so we'll just skip those for now. The last part that I'm going to fill in is the background with this blue color. And I'm not only going to fill it in, but I'm also going to recolor the stroke as well. I don't want that big bold black line in the finished illustration. Okay, so next I'm going to grab my selection tool and select the entire illustration and then go up to my object tab, down to live paint and I'm going to choose expand. Then I'm going to grab my direct selection tool, which is the white arrow, and I'm going to select any area that's colored black on my drawing. With that area selected, I'm going to go up to the select tab in the top menu, down to same, and then I'm going to choose fill in stroke from the sub menu. This will select all of the black in my illustration. Now I'm just going to hit my delete key. All you should be left with are the flat colors. If you're still seeing black liner, you probably have one of your top ink layers turned on. Okay, so now that we have all of our flat colors separated on one layer, it's time to add the gradient to the snow sections. Now before I start, I just want to be able to see my ink layer, so I'm going to turn it back on. Just make sure that it's locked out so that you don't accidentally grab it. Now with my flats layer selected, I'm going to grab my direct selection tool and I'm going to select the blue area on the face. And then I'm going to switch over to my selection tool just so that I don't have to look at all of those control points. Next, I'm going to grab my gradient tool and inside of the gradient menu, I'm going to double click on the gradient icon in the top left hand corner. This will apply it to my selected piece of canvas. Now I don't want that black color in my gradient. So I'm going to double click on the little black control point in the gradient slider and then from the pop-up swatch menu, I'm going to choose that light color blue. I'm also going to change the gradient type over to radial, which is the middle one. Now when I put my cursor near the back end of the gradient control arm, you can see that it changed to a curved arrow. That means that I can now swing this gradient around and face it in the direction that I want. What I want is my white end to be facing toward my light source and the blue end to be facing the shadows. Now if you want to expand the gradient, switch over to your direct selection tool and just grab and drag the little black dot at the end of the gradient control arm. You want your white hot spot to be right around the area of the eyes and you should be seeing a nice gradual transition from white to blue as you get further to the edge of the snowman's face on both the left and right hand sides. When you're done, you should have more blue on the left side than on the right and that's simply because there's going to be more shadow on that side of the character. You can actually see the transition better if you turn off your ink layer. So just play with it until you get the look that you want. Because the blue is so light, the transition is subtle, but if you used a darker blue, it would probably be too harsh once the shadows were put in. Now this is the time consuming part, because now you have to do the exact same thing with each of these individual snow shapes. Now to save time, I'm going to do all of these snow chunks at once. What you're looking to achieve here is a white hot spot on the top of each chunk and a cool blue area toward the bottom. Now just know that it can be a little tricky to maneuver this many overlapping gradient arms all at the same time, but if you zoom in really close, it'll make it a little easier to grab them and reposition them. Now I know there are a few of you who are probably thinking, isn't there a way to do them all just with one gradient slider? And yes, there is, but it wouldn't give us the effect that we're looking for. Because all of the snow chunks are at different levels, doing it that way would result in the back chunks getting nothing but pure white and the front chunks becoming predominantly blue. So although this way may take a little more time, in the end it's going to give us a far better result. I realize that this part probably seems like a pain in the butt, but trust me, it's going to give your overall illustration a much more professional look to it. And once you get the hang of working with gradients, this process will go a lot quicker. If you find doing them all at once a little difficult, you can always do them one by one.
If you find that you're really having a problem maneuvering one of these gradient arms, just pull it off to the side and then reposition it there. Once you've got it facing the direction that you want, just slide it back into place. Okay, now that our flats are done, we can lock out that layer. And again, make sure that you're saving your document as you go. Now that I'm seeing the drawing with the flat colors in, I really don't like that bold black line around the background. So I'm going to unlock my ink layer and using my direct selection tool, I'm going to select the ellipse and delete it. Then I'm just going to lock my ink layer back out when I'm done. Next, we're going to work on the shadows. To do this, I'm going to turn off both my ink and flats layer and then turn on my shadow layer. So what we need to do is figure out where all of our shadows are going to be. To do that, I'm going to switch my brush over to a double taper brush and reduce the stroke weight to about 0.25. Now you can paint in your shadows using a paintbrush in Illustrator, but I don't like doing it that way. I like my shadow edges to be very crisp and clean, just like the rest of my line art. So for that reason, I prefer to draw in where I want my shadows to be and then just bucket fill them in all at once. So to start off, I need to unlock and select my shadows layer. Now we know the light source is coming from the top right hand corner, which means that our shadows are going to fall mostly on the left side of our illustration. So what you're going to want to do is, following the shape and contour of your line art, draw lines in spots where you think that the shadows would begin to show up on your character. And make sure that your brush fidelity is set all the way to smooth for this part. Remember, your character is sort of cylindrical, so you need to figure out which areas of the body would not be hit by the light source. And then, you just need to draw in lines where you think those shadows would start. Now it's extremely important that you're overlapping your strokes, as well as the line art of your illustration. Don't leave any open areas, otherwise you won't be able to bucket fill in the area with color. So basically, just go around your illustration and find any areas where you think the light source would not be able to reach the area directly. Most of these areas will either be on the left side of your character or directly below another object like the hat or scarf. And keep in mind that although many of the objects like the nose, the stone buttons, as well as the snow chunks will have shadows on them, they will also be casting shadows onto the snow below them. Again, when you're drawing these lines, try to stay true to the contour of your ink layer. Also, pay attention to how far the object that's casting the shadow is away from the object that is receiving the shadow. The farther the casting object is away from the receiving object, the longer the shadow will be. These lines don't have to be perfect. As long as all of your shadows are occurring toward the same direction, you should be fine. If you find that you're having difficulty staying with the contour of the ink layer because your brush is over smoothing, just take your brush fidelity down a bit. Remember, anytime you come across something that would cast a shadow on the object that's behind or below it, add in a shadow line. I realize that as you get more and more lines on your artboard that this illustration is going to begin to look like a train wreck. But trust me, once you fill in all of the shadow colors, it's really going to take your drawing to the next level. Now if by chance you get to the end and you find that you have too many shadows, you can always delete some. This part of the drawing process can sometimes be quite tedious, and this is one of the reasons that I'm a really big fan of audiobooks. Actually, it doesn't even have to be an audiobook. You can just open up one of your favorite podcasts and listen to that while you draw. And that being said, this is a good time as any for a shameless plug. My Doodle Art podcast would be the perfect accompaniment to your drawing session. Not only do you get an hour or so of podcasts to listen to, but you also get a time-lapse drawing video to boot. So it'll not only keep your mind occupied, but will make you feel like you're in a drawing session with someone else. This process is one of the reasons that I've never actually colored in one of my full page doodles. Just the thought of having to add this many lines to a drawing that is as detailed as some of my doodle illustrations are gives me nightmares. But if you're someone who likes doing really simple cartoon illustrations, then this technique is perfect for you. And in reality, this process doesn't take that much longer than just painting the shadows in. Yes, the line drawing part is a little time consuming, but the bucket fill part is way quicker than painting the shadows in with a brush. 
So I think it all pretty much balances out in the end. When it comes to creating the shadow lines for your snow chunks, because they're drawn as slightly more angular shapes, you may need to reduce your brush fidelity just a bit, just to be able to get those sharper corners. Don't forget to add in the cast shadows from your snow chunks onto your ground snow. Okay, so once you have all of your shadow lines drawn in, grab your selection tool, drag over the entire illustration, and then go through the cleanup process. When you're done, grab your direct selection tool and just delete any overlapping lines that are falling into the areas where your shadows will be. If you bucket fill in your shadow areas without removing those overlapping lines first, then when you do eventually delete the black line art, those lines are going to leave a white space where your shadow color should be. Just think of it like putting a sticker on your body before you go sun tanning. Once you remove the sticker, the area underneath the sticker will be whiter than the tanned area. It's the same idea. If you want to play it on the safe side, just remove all of the overlapping lines. It may take a little longer, but at least you'll avoid any issues later on. Just make sure you're not deleting any of your character ink lines. You need to have a closed off area in order to keep your shadow color confined. So if you end up deleting one of your character lines, then chances are you're going to end up creating a shadow where the flat color should be. And if it's your first time trying this technique out, once you have all of your shadow lines drawn in, it may not be a bad idea to duplicate this layer before you fill it in. That way, if you missed anything, you can just go back to the duplicate layer and fix your mistake without having to redraw all of your shadows from scratch. You really need to make sure that you're continually zooming in and out while you're deleting these lines. Some of your stroke overlaps may be very tiny, so if you're zoomed out, you may miss them. My rule of thumb when it comes to creating shadows is that they should never take up more than 25% of your overall drawing. Now obviously there are going to be times when you're going to want really heavy shadows, like for nighttime scenes, but for the average daytime illustration, that 25% rule should work out in most cases. Now once you've got it all cleaned up, grab your selection tool and select your illustration. Then go up to the object tab in the top menu, down to live paint, and from the sub menu choose make. Then grab your bucket fill tool and the dark blue swatch and start filling in all of the areas that you've just designated as shadows. Now this is the easy part of creating shadows. It would take you quite a while to paint in this many shadows this precisely. That's the thing about drawing. Although the process of drawing can sometimes be extremely frustrating, the feeling you get when the illustration is done is well worth the struggle. And the good news is, is that this shadow layer is almost done.
Once you've finished, grab your selection tool one more time, select your illustration, and then go up to the object tab in the top menu, down to live paint, and choose expand. Then grab your direct selection tool, select a piece of the black line art, and with it selected, go up to the select tab in the top menu, down to same, and then choose fill in stroke. Now just hit your delete key and you should have nothing but shadows on this layer. Okay, so if we turn on our flats layer, you can see how the shadows start to fit in. And if we turn on our ink layer, we can really see it all come together. Now obviously we can't leave our shadows this dark. So what you need to do next is go up to the window tab in the top menu and from the drop down, open the transparency tab. Using your selection tool, select the shadows on your artboard and then go up to the transparency tab and change the blending mode from normal to multiply and lower the opacity to around 15%. You can go a little bit darker if you want to, but I wouldn't go any higher than 20% opacity. And keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to use blue as your shadow color. You can use black, purple, or any other color for that matter. I just like to use blue in winter scenes because snow tends to refract light with a bluish tinge to it due to the water elements. Okay, so now that we've got our shadows done, it's time to do our highlights. So lock out your shadow layer and turn it off along with the ink and flats layer and then turn on and unlock your highlights layer. Now what we're going to do is exactly the same thing as we did on our shadows layer, only this will be a lot quicker because there are a lot less highlights on our character. So start off by grabbing your double taper brush and set the stroke weight to 0.25 and just make your brush stroke color black. You don't need a fill color. Now because vector shadows and highlights tend to be crisp and clean, at least the way I do them anyway, I don't like putting highlights on soft objects. So in this case, the only things that I'm going to be highlighting are the nose, the arms, and the stones. Everything else will just have shadows on it. It's really easy to go overboard with highlights, and if you do, it'll start to make your drawing difficult to read. So for that reason, I like to keep the highlights simple. Top of the nose, top of the arms, top of the stones. Now if you want to put highlights on your cloth objects, that's totally fine. I do it from time to time when I feel the drawing calls for it. It's just that this illustration already has so much white in it that adding more highlights might just be overkill. Once you have all of your highlight lines drawn in, grab your selection tool, drag it over your entire illustration, and then do the cleanup process. Once that process is done, with your illustration still selected, go back up to Object, down to Live Paint, and choose Make. Then open your swatches tab, select the yellow color and then grab your bucket fill tool and fill in the highlight areas of the nose and the arms. Then select your white swatch and fill in the highlight areas on the stones. Once you finish doing that, grab your selection tool one more time, select your illustration, go up to object and down to live paint and choose expand. Then grab your direct selection tool and select any area of black. With it selected, go up to the select tab, down to same and choose fill in stroke. Then hit your delete key. There should be nothing left on your layer except your highlights. And now if we turn on all of our layers, your character should now have both shadows and highlights. As for the blend mode and opacity for these highlights, you can leave them just the way they are. If you want to soften the highlights a bit, just change the blend mode to lighten. But other than that, the character itself is done. Now all we have left to do is just add in some falling snow into the background. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do to create snow is start by creating two new layers. And we do that by clicking on the little plus icon in the bottom of the layer menu. I'm going to rename these two layers to snow top and snow bottom. And I'm going to select the bottom snow layer first. Next, I'm going to need a different brush but I'm not going to use one of my brushes for this. I just need a standard circular brush. So I'm going to go up to the window tab in the top menu and from the drop down, I'm going to open up the brushes tab. I'm just going to use the standard five point brush for this part. Next, I'm going to set my stroke to transparent and I'm going to set my fill color to the same color as my background. 
Then I'm going to double click on my color swatch in the toolbar and then I'm going to move the color picker to a lighter shade of blue. Okay, so I'm going to keep my brush size fairly small and I'm just going to start placing individual dots randomly around the background ellipse. Don't make the spacing between all of the dots too equal. Having a few of them clumped together will make the snowfall look a lot more random. Once I have them all placed, I'm going to increase my brush size by using my right square bracket key on my keyboard. I'm just going to click it about three or four times. Now I'm just going to place a few more random dots around my background. Okay, so now that I've got the bottom snow layer filled in, I'm going to lock it out and then I'm going to select the top snow layer. I'm going to use the same brush, only this time I'm going to use the color white and I'm going to increase the brush size by a few more clicks. Now only create a few of these dots, don't put too many. Because if you get too carried away, it's going to start looking like a blizzard. What you need to do next is grab your selection tool and select all of the dots. If you want, you can go up to the object tab and group them together. But with them still selected, go up to the effects tab, down to blur, and from the submenu, choose Gaussian blur. Now unfortunately, when I recorded this video, I didn't realize that the blur pop-up menu was on my other monitor, so it's not being recorded. But that doesn't matter. Just set the radius of the blur to about 7 pixels and then click the OK button. The reason that you're adding the blur is 1. To give the feeling of movement and 2. To give the illusion of closeness. If you've ever taken photographs of fallen snow, you've probably noticed that the really close snowflakes tend to be out of focus, especially if there was another object that was the focal point in the scene. By adding this blur, we're trying to recreate that effect. And that's basically it. Your cartoon snowman is complete. So if we lock out all of the layers and go through each of them one by one, you can see how each added layer makes your drawing look a little more finished as well as professional. But there's one more thing that I want to draw your attention to. Do you see how bold your ink lines look right now? Some of that boldness is a result of tiny lines that are surrounding your strokes. It's just part of working in vector software. When I export this illustration out as a PNG, the line work is going to look a little bit thinner in the image than it does on the artboard inside of Illustrator. And that's simply because those tiny lines are removed when you render your illustration out. When you look at the two images side by side, the difference is very slight, but it's there. I'm just pointing this out to you because sometimes when you're drawing, you may think that your brush strokes are a little bit too thick, so you'll reduce the stroke weight of them, only to find that after the drawing is completely finished and rendered out, that the strokes are now actually too thin. And that's just due to those added lines inside of Illustrator, so just keep that in mind whenever you're drawing. Okay, so hopefully this drawing tutorial has given you a much better idea of how to draw cartoons in Adobe Illustrator. And if you like this type of content and you want to see more, then do me a favor and hit that like button and be sure to subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any of my future episodes. I also want to remind you that if you want to take your drawing in Adobe Illustrator to the next level, my Doodle Art Brush Pack is available in my Gumroad store for just $5 and that I have a link to a tutorial video showcasing the brushes at the end of this video. Also, if you have any suggestions for another Christmas themed cartoon drawing tutorial, be sure and let me know in the comments section below. And if you're new to my channel and you're not sure what it's all about, in a nutshell, I teach artists how to turn their drawing hobbies into passive income using income streams like YouTube and self-publishing. And I have extended playlists on my channel with hours of tutorials covering both of those topics and more. So if you're an artist who is thinking about creating your own YouTube channel, then check out my playlist Getting Started on YouTube. But if you're interested in learning how to make money from your artwork right now, then be sure and check out my playlist Self-Publishing 101. It has everything you'll need to get your self-publishing business up and running, and you can find a link to it right here. Until next time, take care.